Greetings to all. Uh, I'm Dave Banks and I have the great honor to sit down with Brother Willard Collins today and our desire is to get his testimony as to uh, what he witnessed in the ministry of Brother Branham and, and uh, also what he has seen as the Holy Ghost has ministered through him and around him in his 46 years, his near 46 years as pastor of Branham Tabernacle. And Brother Collins uh, first met Brother Branham in 1955. So he is certainly a wealth of information and he has so many wonderful stories that testify to Jesus Christ being the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this time we'll turn it over to Brother Collins and he's just going to start with the beginning and just take us right through until today. God bless you, Brother Collins. Well, God bless you, Brother Banks. I yes, appreciate sir. that. Yes, sir. Uh, that's just wonderful. It's a highlight of my life to talk about the things that I've seen since I met Brother Branham. I want to start with this. I pastored a Methodist church four years before I met Brother Branham. And uh, I had to go to Macon, Georgia to see him for my first time. And I had tried for years. I knew there was more to it than what I had experienced. And I tried to find that. I, I didn't know where it was. But uh, one time I went to Bowling Green, Kentucky. The Jessup brothers was having a big meeting. And I thought maybe that was it. But it was a good services, but that wasn't it. I didn't satisfy completely. So I heard about Brother Branham. And uh, I heard some mighty good things about him. And then I heard he was going to be in Macon, Georgia at a given time. And I told my wife, I said, now, we've got a little baby. Uh, his name was Michael, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, we're going to get a real nice lady to take care of him because I want you to get everything you can out of this meeting. And uh, she was a little hesitant to leave him. Wasn't very old. And uh, finally she said, okay. So we left him with her. And she was there for one night service. And she got to worrying about Michael. And I said, sweetheart, just call and talk to her and you'll feel better. And uh, that'll be fine. Well, she called, and the lady says, Oh, my goodness. Said, he's cried ever since you left. He won't quit. And said, I took him to the doctor, and the doctor said, There's nothing wrong with the child. He's just missing his mother. <laughs> <laughs> then you know what happened there. Mm -hmm. I, after that first service, I brought her all the way back uh, to... Uh, this area which is uh, in Indiana and uh, I got ready as soon as I got back and headed back for Macon, Georgia because I had found something that satisfied mm -hmm. uh, most wonderful service and uh, I got back all by myself and I, I was in the bleachers and they'd built a platform for Brother Branham out in a football field. And he was ministering from there. Well, there was two ladies sitting to my left in the bleachers. And uh, I, I listened to them, you know. And uh, Brother Branham got up and said, If I ever tell you anything wrong... Don't never believe anything else I say because God don't make no mistakes. <laughs> and uh, uh, then he had a prayer line at the end of the service. And one lady, he told her what all was wrong with her. 
And then he said, you don't live in this city. You live in Augusta, Georgia. House number is so-and-so. And your name is so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, when uh, he said that, those two ladies said, uh-oh. He missed it that time. We know her. She does not live there. Then I had to play Mr. District Attorney for a while <laughs> and check that one out because I wanted to be sure I knew where I stood. I checked it out, and unbeknownst to those two ladies, she moved there two days prior to that service, <laughs> and they didn't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that settled that. <clears throat> well, then... We didn't have anything. We was uh, poor, but uh, we loved the Lord. And I had pastored the Methodist Church four years, and uh, I, I was uh, I was so anxious to find what I was looking for. And I know in my heart, I found it right there. Uh, and uh, I was very sick at the time. I had ulcers in my stomach, and they were terrible. My wife had to fix special food for me all the time. And uh, I went that service and I looked it over. And I was too far from Brother Branham. I could see him, but uh, I was too far from him. I wanted to get closer. And uh, there was some boys making tapes right up around him. And they had folding chairs. Now, I didn't have no tape recorder but I had a folding chair. <laughs> so I took it with me and set it right in front of Brother Branham in the service. Well, he got, uh, he got through the service, and he had a prayer line, and he, then after the prayer line, he prayed for a cot case or two and some wheelchair cases, and then he walked around behind where the boys were making tapes. And uh, he got to me and he stopped and put his hand on my shoulder. Said, Father, heal him, he's sick too. Then he walks back up on the platform and says, You probably couldn't see it, but the angel of the Lord led me to every person I went to wow. when I left here. Wow. I said, Oh, Lord, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so... I couldn't eat hardly anything, but after that service, I went and got me a big hamburger with a piece of onion on it, and I ate it. First one I'd eaten. Wow. And uh, it didn't hurt me a bit. <laughs> and I was getting ready to go to bed in my old truck. I slept in the truck. And uh, there was a voice, a man's voice, uh, I didn't see nobody, but I heard the voice clear. And here's what he said. And you think you're healed. I said, yeah. I talked back to it. <laughs> I said, yes, I do. I ate that hamburger and it hadn't hurt me a bit with that piece of onion on it. And I had to wear glasses all the time up to that point. And uh, directly the voice came back. I did not see anybody. But it was a man's voice. And it said, And you think you're healed? Then what about your eyes? And I thought, Uh-huh. I see what's going on. <laughs> He's trying to make me doubt this thing. And I just reached up and got my glasses and took them off. I said, I won't need them no more. Wow. And uh, it wasn't long after that till I had to get my driver's license. And they examined my eyes. And they said, well, they're not perfect, but you can get by without glasses this time. I said, well, thank you. That's fine. 
Then the next year I had to get my driver, or the next time I had to get my driver's license. Then they checked my eyes again and said, your eyes are perfect. <laughs> now here I am, 90 years old, and I can still see and hear good. <laughs> and I'm so thankful for that. That was the hand of the Lord in the beginning mm -hmm. of what was taking place. Amen. Mm -hmm. Then, after the service is there, I was so thrilled. I just couldn't hardly stand it. I found what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, now let me tell you what happened to my wife. I'm proud of that girl. <laughs> I come back home where she was. She had been a Methodist all of her life. Her dad was a Methodist preacher. And uh, I'd pastored a Methodist church for four years. And I come back home and I said, Sweetheart, we're leaving the Methodist church. I expected her to ask questions. Why, where we're going, what we're going to do, we didn't have nothing. <laughs> and uh, she, she didn't say one word. I'm so proud of that girl. <laughs> I'll tell you what she did. Started getting things in order to move. Wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> And you didn't know what the future had Oh, to <laughs> no, I had no idea. There I was with four children and a wife, and a preacher don't have no resume to get a job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. And uh, I thought, what am I going to do? I come out of the Methodist church. We didn't have anything. How am I going to make it? I've got to feed and clothe them, send the kids to school, got to have a place to live. And I tried in New Albany, Clarksville, and Jeffersonville to rent a place. Nobody would rent to me because I had four children and evidently they had rented to a family somewhere that throwed the house out the window and uh, they wouldn't rent to anybody with children. Mm -hmm. And and no job and no place to go. I said, oh my, what am I going to do? <laughs> so I decided that I would try to find a job. And I had done some mechanical work. I went to Vissings Buick, was in Jeffersonville. I said, I need a job. And they talked to me a while and said, well, I'll tell you what, you, we'll hire you, but I'll tell you what your wages will be. Half of the money you take in, you get, we get the other half. At least it was a job. I said, okay, that, that's, uh, that's a start. Well, I went all the way to Charlestown where they built those little shacks for the powder plant workers. And they built one that housed three families together, all together. And uh, I was able to rent the middle one. And somebody said, where do you live? I said, I live in Charlestown. Oh, they said, that's nice. I said, yeah, and I've got close neighbors. We're four inches apart on each side. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, they said, uh, well, that's nice. Well, I worked at Vissings and was naturally getting far behind with everything. And to show you how the Lord works in such mysterious ways, this is going to be hard for anybody to believe. But so help me. It's the truth. The fellow... <clears throat> On my left side, he was an alcoholic. And he come in one night and told his wife, something I'm going to kill you tonight. And we could hear every word he was saying four inches apart. Mm -hmm. 
and oh it scared us we thought oh my goodness what do we do and we laid there just a minute I expected to hear a gun go off any minute and it didn't and directly the front door slammed and I said well I guess he's killed her and gone looked out there and that poor old woman was going to the coal bucket to get a bucket of coal to keep the fire going. Mm -hmm. I said, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. And um, But the fellow that lived on the other side was from eastern Kentucky, a fine boy, a young fellow. He come to me, said, I'm opening a Texaco service station and he said, I want you to come and do my mechanical work, and I'll pay you more than they're paying you up there. I said, well, I'll have to give them a two-week notice. He said, give it to them. I said, okay. I gave it to them, and I kept up with the mechanical work. Everything was going fine. And what I wasn't doing mechanical work, I'd be doing something. I'd have to wait on the pumps or something to stay busy and they were fine two boys and they were fine boys and uh, I was uh, the, they was busy doing something and a, a beautiful car pulled up to the pumps it was beautiful it wasn't very old either shiny solid black and I went out to wait on expecting to hear fill it up that's what everybody said and uh, I said, what for you? The driver says, how much will you give us for the car? I didn't have no money. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, I guess it's all I had. I said, I wouldn't give you but $10. Now that's the part that people can't believe. <laughs> you could buy a car for $10. <laughs> and a beautiful car. And uh, said uh, he, and I, I know they wouldn't take it. I said, "What I'd give you, you wouldn't take." He said, "Make us an offer." I said, "I wouldn't give but ten dollars." He reached in the glove box, got the title, handed it out the window, said, "Here's the title. Where's the ten dollars? And which way's the bus station?" <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> I thought, i never seen nothing like this before that wouldn't buy the lug bolt. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I told him everything, you know, and I give him the ten dollars. I'm sure it's all I had. And uh, there was two of them, and they hiked off to the bus station. Well, I go inside and call the state police. I said, I've got a stolen car down here. I'd like for y'all to come down. <laughs> well, you would have thought the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, they said, are you sure it's stolen? I said, I'm positive it is. I couldn't think of nothing else. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, give us a serial number off of it, and we will check it out and call you back. They did called back and said, no, that car is not stolen. They bought that in Michigan and paid cash for it. I was so got, I thought, what have I got? <laughs> <laughs> it's not stolen. And I bought it for $10. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I started checking on it to see what was wrong. The only other thing it could be, they was just afraid to try the car any further. I started it up and it sounded horrible. And uh, I got to checking. It had five gallons of gasoline in the crankcase where it should have been five quarts of oil. Well, then I checked the fuel pump and I knew that had to come from the fuel pump because it was bolted on the side of the block. The diaphragm and the fuel pump had a crack in it and he's putting a portion of the gas in the crankcase. Uh, and uh, I, I thought, oh my, I drained it out. And we had an old used pump there that fitted. So I put it on, 
put five quarts of oil in it, and it run like a sewing machine. Just beautiful. I went to my boss. I said, if I could make $75 on that car, it would really help me right now. He said, put it on the windshield and set it out there. I put 85 I want to get my $10 back. <laughs> <laughs> well, people would come look at it and say, my, it's a beautiful car, but there's something bad wrong with it. It's too cheap mm -hmm. for $85. <laughs> I thought, I'll stop that. I went and put a two before that 85 <laughs> well, I drove up in a Ford. It was dirty, but it's okay. Said, "How you trade?" I said, "Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take two hundred and fifty dollars to boot." <laughs> he looked it all over. Said, "Here's the two fifty, and uh, I give him the title, and he took the car." <laughs> Uh, but I got the Ford then and cleaned it up. It cleaned up pretty good. <laughs> and I put 285 on it, just like I did that one. That went pretty good. And uh, some fellow pulled up and said, I got a Ford Coupe at home, the rear end's out of it. But he said, I've got all the parts. Uh, how would you trade? I thought, well, that 250 worked pretty good the other time, so I said, I'll, I'll take 250 to boot. He looked it all over. I said, that is, if you'll bring <clears throat> the car down here. He said, I'll do it. He brought the car. Uh, he, <clears throat> he said, here's the 250, and I'll bring the car. I said, okay. Well, I was putting the rear end in the Ford Coupe that he talked about, and somebody pulled up and said, what you going to do with that and you get done with it? I said, I'm going to sell it. He said, how much you want for it? I said, a hundred dollars. He said, you don't have to go no further. I'm going to take it. He gave me a hundred dollars. <laughs> now that was all for a ten dollar car. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord knew I had a need mm -hmm. and he come to my rescue. <laughs> then I went back inside the station. The phone rang. It was Vissings Buick where I worked at. And they said, we've got a car that we cannot fix. We've invested a lot of money in it. And we can't get a dime out of it if we can't get it to run it. If I send it up there, will you look at it? I thought, little me? <laughs> And I thought, well, okay, I'll look at it. Now, that's all I expected to do, too. And they sent it up there. I checked everything they had done, all the parts they'd put on it, and everything they had done perfect. And that car wouldn't run worth a nickel. And I just sitting, standing there watching it try to run. Had the hood up, and it had a four-bar carburetor on it. And you know, they've got a bunch of lead plugs around them. And I I thought, and this couldn't have been me because I wasn't that familiar with it. I thought, I wonder if one of those passages inside that carburetor where it's supposed to be the fuel or air would be stopped up uh, causing all this trouble. I'm going to drill out this one right here. I did. It was the right one. <laughs> it was so stopped up with carbon, I had to take a drill bit and a drill and run it through that carburetor to open that passage up. I did. Then I blowed it all out, put it back together, and it run beautiful, <laughs> just as smooth. I called Vision back up. I said, you can come and get your car. He said, is it fixed? <laughs> I said, well, it runs pretty good. He sent somebody up there and got it. 
But this shows you how the Lord works. I didn't do none of it. It was the Lord. So he got the car back up there and the phone rang again. He said, you don't know it, but you're coming back to work for us. I thought, oh my goodness. He said, we'll pay you more than they're paying you. I'll send you to Cincinnati to Automatic Transmission School. We'll give you a credit card to travel on, and I'll pay all the bill. I said, oh my goodness. I said, I'll have to give them a two weeks notice. He said, give it to them. I said, okay. I did. And I knew a Mr. Jones that worked there, and he was he worked on automatic transmissions. And I knew if I got in trouble on my first one, I had never overhauled one. The Buick Down and Flow has got over 1,200 pieces in them. Mm. Mm. Some of them will go either way, but only works one way. Mm. And uh, I went to the school, and uh, all the charts and everything, you know, they never look like the real thing. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I come back, loaded all my tools, and went to Vissing. He said, the shop foreman said, I got a transmission for you. I said, well, good. I tore down a transmission. I had parts on the bench. I had parts on the shelf. I had parts under the shelf. <laughs> had that thing all tore down. Hadn't yet found out what was wrong with it. And Mr. Jones didn't come to work. <laughs> I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? <laughs> I went to the shop for him and I said, Mr. Jones didn't come in today. He said, no, I forgot to tell you, he's on a two-week vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, that's one day I almost sweated blood. <laughs> First, I had to examine the parts and figure what was wrong with it and then put the thing back together and... Uh, I did, but I, I said, that's the nearest I ever come to sweating blood. <laughs> but I got it done, and it worked. Mm. If it hadn't, I don't know what I'd have done. Hung it up, I guess. <laughs> <coughs> but it wasn't too long till I did 19 of them straight, one after another after nothing in between, and I didn't have to tear one of them back down. So the Lord blessed wow. me. Mm. and helped me through all of that and uh, then that became my livelihood you know mm -hmm. so that's what the Lord did for an unworthy creature like me <laughs> and then I got to meet Brother Branham I hadn't met him yet but, uh, now, how much time has gone by since you were in the meetings and quit the Methodist Church before you met him? Uh, I was, I met him uh, soon after the meeting. Okay. Soon after. Mm -hmm. Brother Estel Beeler took me to see Banks, Banks Woods. He lived next door to Brother Brown. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, let's go see Banks. And I said, okay. Well, we got there. And they was mowing a big yard laid in between them. Mm -hmm. And Banks come around, and I shook hands with him, and uh, he greeted me. And I looked, and another fellow was coming, mowing. And he had his shirt off and great balls of sweat standing in. It was hot weather. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was Brother Brown. He come on over where I was, and Banks says, Brother Branham, this is that Methodist preacher that was healed in Macon. <laughs> and Brother Branham just shut his more off, put out his hand, and said, And you're that Methodist preacher. I said, Yes, sir, but I'm coming out of the Methodist church. <laughs> he said, All right. He said, uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you how to do it. And I thought, be one of those long, drawn out, you know. <laughs> and uh, I said, that's wonderful. He said, all right. He said, as peaceable 
as possible. <laughs> I said, thank you, Brother Brownham. I appreciate that. And he said, and I'll be praying for you. Mm -hmm. I said, wonderful. Oh, boy, he evidently <laughs> talked to the Lord about it. Because <laughs> <clears throat> I felt not that high before that district superintendent when I had to tell him. I was leaving the Methodist Church. He said, how come? I got an appointment with him, met him in Louisville. And I said, there's just some things in the Methodist Church that I don't agree with. I didn't know many, but I knew one, water baptism. I'd already learned that down there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, uh, well, why? And I said, uh, well, one thing, water baptism. He said, uh, well, they want you back down there. That's the way the Methodist Church worked. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I'll tell you what, you go back for another year. Teach anything you want to. Baptize any way you want to. And stay another year. I thought, no, I can't do that. That'd split the church. There would be some that'd go for it, mm -hmm. and some wouldn't, and I, I, I'm not going to split the church. I'm not going to do that. I said, no, I, I can't do that. And he followed me to the door. I was a young man then, 29 years old. He followed me to the door, laid his hand on my shoulder, and said, young man, I've only got one thing to say. If Martin Luther had never seen anything except Catholicism, we'd all be Catholic today. That was our parting word. <laughs> I said, that man will be there. Sure as where He'll come in uh, uh, yeah. uh, some way. He'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Because he had something in his heart. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, my and then things really begin to happen. Uh, I, can't, I can't get over it yet. I'm going to tell this, and I'll probably come back uh, before it's over to some more mm -hmm. along this line. But uh, I had a daughter, and she was getting a job in Louisville at the hospital. And she had to go to Louisville to make ready for the job. And I said, who's going with you? She's a pretty girl. And she said, nobody, I'm going by myself. I said, oh, no, you're not. I, I won't let you. I was walking in Louisville by myself. I heard shots far up ahead. I saw two men running. I went on up there and there's a dead man laying there. I said, you're not going by yourself. Mm -hmm. So I went with her. Okay. We went to Second Street where it comes into Broadway. We parked the car and we, as the busiest street in Louisville, I think, and we waited for the light to change. We crossed and went on a good long ways and she took care of her business and we came back to there. And uh, I said, uh, I started to cross the street when the light got right. And I got about halfway across Second Street and I went down in the street. And she said she tried to get me up and couldn't. And she said she went to screaming for somebody to come and help her. And two people came and picked me up and took me to the car. She said, Daddy, let me take you to the hospital. I said, oh, no, no, no. She said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go home. Okay. We got home. And... Uh, my daughter, Betty, she's very aggressive. And she got a hold of it. Well, she called 
Jewish hospital in Lowell and got a hold of Dr. Wise, which is a, their best heart doctor, and told him what happened. He said, bring him in. Well, nothing would do but me go in. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. He checked me and said, well, you blood pressure's good and this, that, and the other. Then he hooked me up to a machine that spits out paperwork and tells him what's going on. I've never seen one of them machines before. And it began to spit out paperwork and he says, oh no, oh no, oh no. <laughs> he said, uh, you can't preach no more. Uh, you can't drive no more. He was really laying, I thought, what's he going to spit out next? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, you're fortunate to be with us, that's all. He said, you had a bad heart attack. He said, in fact, your heart stopped. And he said, we have a hard time starting hearts back when they stop in the hospital. And he said, it started back on its own. <laughs> but he said, I'm putting you in the hospital tomorrow. Okay, that was on a Wednesday. I go to church on Wednesday night. I called the deacons. I said, bring the anointing oil and come and pray for me. And they did. The next morning, they sent me to the hospital, Jewish hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. So he hooked me up to the same type of machine that the doctor had the day before. Nurse was there. He said, I don't understand this. He said, there's not one thing wrong with this man's heart. <laughs> said, uh, he's got a perfect heart. The nurse said, you mean a man of his age has got a perfect heart? Well, he said he has. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you at that time, brother? Uh, one far from 90. Oh, this has been recent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, I, he said uh, he's got a perfect heart. Well, the uh, doctor Wise sent a bunch of papers. What a bad shape I was in to him. Well, he started making out papers to send back. He sent back to him what a good shape I was in. <laughs> he didn't stop at that. He wanted to make sure. And he did an echogram. Have you all ever had one of them? I mean, I didn't know my heart made no such noise. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he did an echogram and he said, my goodness, he said, that's perfect too. <laughs> then he said, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to do a heart catheterization. He said, I'm going in his groin with a camera and I'm going and see what's going on. He did. He said, there's nothing wrong. He don't, don't even need a bypass of no kind. He <laughs> said, he's just perfect. Wow. Well, uh, when the Dr. Wise found out about it, he said, you got to come back. You got to come back. <laughs> I went back and uh, he started. And he did just what he did the other time. He said, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. He said, uh, I just don't get it. He said, uh, I'll tell you what I'd recommend. I said, yes, sir. He said, you go to Israel, take every tour they've got. <laughs> 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 and uh, he said, uh, uh, everything's fine. I said, well, doctor, can I drive now? He said, not only drive, you can do anything you want to. <laughs> and he said, would you pray for me? Wow, wow. I said, I believe every bit of that happened 
for that doctor. He had never seen anything like that before. Yes, sir. He had the proof that he needed, mm -hmm. and that was wonderful. <laughs> and I never actually had pain out of it, but uh, I felt pretty weak for a while, but I mean, it all came back, and that wow. was all it was to it. Wow. So now that brings up some things that I saw with my own eyes. I saw when Brother Branham prayed for a dead man at the tabernacle. Brother Wade, he died. He was, he was almost in the front of the church. I was a few feet from him. And Brother Branham had the people to stand for dismissing. And Brother Wade pitched forward. His wife was a registered nurse. When he did, she dropped down on her knees before him and checked him. And then she screamed. He was gone. Brother Branham kind of quieted the people a little bit and stepped down there calmly, walked over to him, laid his hands on him, and said, Father, let his life come back into him. He did. The man went out and ate a chicken dinner. Mm, my goodness. Oh. Mm -mm. Listen, there was never a man on this earth that was any greater than Brother William Marion Branham. He didn't make mistakes. He didn't jump at conclusions. He stayed with the facts. Mm -hmm. And he, he was the greatest man I've ever seen in my whole life. And whatever he said, I believed it. And I still do. He is, he was in touch with God. And he didn't tell you anything until the Lord showed him. And he, he laid it all out. A beautiful, beautiful picture of it all. And uh, now let me tell you, let me tell you what happened. He come to me then and said, would you accept the responsibility of being a deacon in the Branham Tabernacle? And what year is this, Brother Collins? Do you know? Oh, uh, 57 maybe. So this is just a few it's years. It's close, after. close to the time I started. Yeah, okay. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, he said, uh, uh, would you accept the responsibility of it? He said, you pray about it. Well, he come back later and said, uh, how do you feel about it? I said, if you think that's what I ought to do, I'll do it. He said, uh, I think that's what you ought to do. I said, okay, I'll try. Well, he was putting in all the deacons. And uh, he come time, come time to vote on me. Show of hand. And he said, Brother Collins, as a, for a deacon in the Brown Tabernacle, and not only deacon, if something happens to Brother Neville, he was the pastor. He takes his place. Hmm. That was the biggest shock I ever got. I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> and uh, he had a show of hands, and there was not one contrary vote. Hmm. I thought, oh, my goodness. But everything went well. And uh, then, while I was pastoring, things 
got hard sometimes. You know how good people will misunderstand things and uh, sometimes jump at conclusions. And uh, I think that's what happened. I loved the people. They were fine people. But they got where when I'd get up to speak, they'd get up and walk out. I'd go out and try to shake hands with them. they just turn their back and walk away. And what period of time is this now? How far into your pastorate is this? Uh, it was after a few years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is maybe in the 70s or, or so? Because Probably. It was you, along there somewhere. You took over in what year? So we can get a, a good idea. Uh, let's see. And uh, let me think just a minute. Okay. 65. 16, latter part of 69. Okay. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, then they started leaving the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I felt sorry for them. And uh, I thought, if I resign, they'll come back. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Mm -hmm. So I wrote up my resignation on Friday. I was going to turn it in Sunday morning. Brother Branham at that time was in Tucson, Arizona. He called me. He said, see, I had the responsibility of the Sunday school and all before Brother Branham passed on. Okay, so you were speaking at, at Sunday school because oh, yeah. this is before Sunday you took school. over as pastor. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, I hated so bad to see him do that. And I thought, I'm going to resign Sunday morning. And I wrote it out. Well, he called me on Saturday and said, Brother Collins, I was up in the mountains praying today and the angel of the Lord told me to call you. What's the matter? Wow. I said, I think everything's all right, Brother Branham. I didn't want to tell him. <laughs> he said, no, there's something wrong. Tell me what it is. Then I, that's exactly what I told him, what I told y'all just now. And he said, I can tell you why they left the church. I said, I'd like to know. And here's the words he said. I hate to repeat it. Mm -hmm. Because they're not of us. Wow. Wow. That was a shock. Mm -hmm. He said, don't you do that. So... I didn't, mm -hmm. and then I stayed on uh, until uh, Brother Branham. Now, he asked me, here, here's what happened. When he moved to Tucson, he come by, I ran a service station. He come by the station and said, I know you want to go. Don't do it now. I'll let you know when it's time for you to come. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. Well, I stayed here. And one night he called me. He said, I told you I'd tell you when it was time for you to come. He said, I believe it's now. He said, I want you to start a church out here. Because... There's so many come out here and they've got nowhere to go to church. Mm -hmm. And I promised them I wouldn't start a church, but you didn't. And how long was he there in Tucson before he gave you the green light to go? Oh, Just a matter of months? Or? Oh, more than that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I started getting ready to go now. 
and uh, he told me I, I tried to sell a station before and didn't get any interest at all. He said that when the time comes, you won't have no trouble. <laughs> I said, okay. Well, what we did then, we lived in a big house trailer. And uh, I went to get a place to set the trailer. Wife and me went. And we got the place. I got a man, an older gentleman, just to set the station and uh, see that gas, uh, they, you know, got gas that needed it and what have you. And uh, we went and got the place and we got back and I pulled up in the station lot. So you've got a place out at Tucson now, ready for the ready for the trailer. Okay. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when I pull up in the lot, the old gentleman come walking out to the car before I got out. He said, "I heard that you might sell this," and I said, "Yeah." He said, get out, it's sold, let's inventory. <laughs> that's how much trouble it was. <laughs> and that's immediately after you get back from Tucson. Immediately after I get back. <laughs> I tell you, the Lord's been too good to me. He's got me spoiled now. <laughs> and uh, then I, now here's something else. I don't normally tell this. I don't like to tell anything. It makes it look questionable sure. on other people. Sure. But I got out there and I pulled that big trailer out there. I had fun. <laughs> that was an ordeal is what <laughs> you're saying. An ordeal. And how many days did it take you to take it out? One there? week. Oh my goodness. 1963 miles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I got to Texarkana. I had to have a permit through every state. I couldn't travel uh, an hour uh, before sundown. Mm -hmm. I couldn't leave of a morning till an hour after sunup. I think it's an hour. It might have been 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finally got there, though. <laughs> and I got there, and uh, Brother Branham come to see me, and he said, now we'll start hunting for a place to start a church. He and Brother Roy Roberson was uh, trying. And uh, we was looking for a place, and we hadn't found one yet. We went several days there looking. And Brother, should I, could I get by without calling the man? Sure, brother? sure. Okay, sure. I'll do that. I don't want to hurt nobody. Mm -hmm. He come out there and got up and announced to the people, I'm going to build a church that'll seat 1,965 people. <laughs> well, Brother Branham came over after he made the announcement. And here's what he said. Did you hear that Brother so-and-so was coming to build a church? to seat 1,965 people. I said, yes, I did. And I never will forget, he just looked down and said, oh, well, let him go ahead and we'll buy from him. Well, he never got it built anyway, so <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and it didn't, therefore, it didn't work out. And then in 65, uh, after Brother Brown's going, uh, no, it was 69, I stayed five years after he gone, he's gone. And uh, we moved back down to the old farm where I was raised at. And they called me then, that was in uh, the latter part of 69, and said, would you come and uh, take over Brother Neville's place? They knew Brother Branham had even voted on it, you know. Brother, can I ask you one question before you get there? Go ahead. I, I, I think it's worth emphasizing. You could visibly see the disappointment on his face 
for what he knew was the perfect will of the Lord out there. Yes. And, and when he dropped his head, that yes. was a clear disappointment. It was. It? Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, when um, we uh, got moved out there, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was uh, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. He would come by and take us on Sunday morning to a nominal church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'd be going to church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He did that uh, I don't know how many times. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was just marvelous. <laughs> and uh, I had the privilege of being in every service that he had out there and went to, uh, with him when uh, he went to California the last time. Uh, I was afraid to go otherwise because I didn't know what day it was going to sink. Mm -hmm. What he did on that, uh, he was at Brother Outlaw's church in Phoenix, Arizona for a service. I had to work as on Saturday. He and Sister Meaty came by and took my wife with them to the service. I'd gotten home when he come back and uh, he s said California is going to sink. That was the first time he had mentioned it in the service was at Brother Outlaw. Mm -hmm. He said it's going to sink. And he said... Uh, the tidal waves, and he didn't call them tsunamis either. Mm -hmm. He said the tidal waves will come to Kentucky. Wow. He said it will be a fulfillment of the scripture of the people weeping their way through the desert, weeping, the water weeping its way through the desert. Mm -hmm. He said it won't be the water weeping, it'll be the people weeping and what the water's doing. Wow, wow. And uh, uh, he, he didn't say when, mm -hmm. but he said it will be, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've, uh, I've watched out for it. Sure. While you were out there, it, it's apparent that Brother Branham was very concerned about not himself starting a church there. Did you get a sense of the opposition, the ministerial opposition out there, there, and oh, take yes. any insight into that? Oh, yes. He'd take us mm -hmm. to maybe a church of God or whatever mm -hmm. more, you know, and they wouldn't even recognize him as being there. Oh, my. Oh, my. Yep. Wow. That's right. My. Oh, I felt so sorry for him. Mm -hmm. And do you remember when uh, the... What was he? Uh, he was Catholic priest. That's what he was. Mm -hmm. Was in the service when Brother Branham uh, leaves of his Bible the stuck together. Mm -hmm. yes. Remember that? Yes. I was there that day. Wow. And the priest, he saw Brother Branham was having trouble because... It was of, printed wrong. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And... He opened his Bible where Brother Branham was trying to read, and he went to Brother Branham and laid the bi his Bible before him and said, read out of my book. <laughs> uh -huh. How about that? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. My. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I just can't get over all the things mm -hmm. that happened. Mm -hmm. and the way they happened. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I had the honor of working on his vehicles. Mm -hmm. And uh, a fella gave him uh, a Cadillac. And he brought it over to where I worked to show me the Cadillac. Mm -hmm. And it had two four-barrel carburetors on it. Was that Carl Williams that was responsible for that? Wasn't no. It? Okay. No, mm -hmm. uh, I forgot what the fellow's name was mm -hmm. that gave it to him. Okay. But he told me, 
he said, uh, uh, I can't think who was responsible for that. Anyway, uh, he said, I wish if they was going to do that, they had to give me a Ford or a Chevrolet one. Because <laughs> said, you get, you look how I feel driving down in a poor country, mm-hmm. like out uh, uh, s- south, you know, down in uh, maybe the colored section. Right. And me driving a big Cadillac, and they can't even afford a horse and buggy or something like that, you mm. know. Wow. And he wrote a piece and apology and put in the paper apologizing for driving a Cadillac. <laughs> he did. Oh. He wow. was the humblest man you mm-hmm. ever saw. Mm-hmm. And he my wife's people live about uh a hundred miles or better from here. Mm-hmm. He come over and he said, Sister, why don't you just take my car, the Cadillac, and go down and see you folks? Really? She said, Oh, no, brother. No. no. Oh, my. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and uh, it was very strange before the wreck, before he went on that last trip. He came over and he said, Brother Collins, put me four of the best tires they make on my van. I said, okay. I ordered four nylon 500 Firestones. That was the best tire they made at that time. Mm -hmm. Put them on. And after he had the wreck, and they called me. I headed that way. And I found the place where he wrecked at. I made the pictures they put in the books. Mm-hmm. I found the car where they'd taken it to and made pictures of it. Mm-hmm. And I looked especially to see the condition of the tires. Mm-hmm. As bad as that car was torn up, there was not one flat tire on it. Wow, wow, how about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder why he was wanting to change the tires. Mm -hmm. But he did. Now, that ended up, I was here in the early 70s, and I went, Brother Arnett took me to Brother Neville's, where the car was He had the car at that time. And what's happened to it since then? Uh, I don't know okay. for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Voice of God may have it mm-hmm. somewhere. Okay. I don't know. Okay. They determined that it wasn't feasible to fix it because they said it would have to be a the by the parts it would have to be a complete different car. Mm-hmm. I believe it. Yeah. Oh, I do Maybe too. Yes, sir. Yes, I sir. do too. Yeah, I certainly do. Well, before we get to you taking over as pastor once you move back, you stayed out there a number of years before yes, you moved five back. five years. Before we get to that, just uh, one, uh, are there any other instances like the night where the pillar of fire came down on the wall and drew the Oh, yes, I, I, I say. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brother Branham was speaking, Mm -hmm. and uh, this was uh, a few services after he had uh, drawn all this on the blackboard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I don't remember how many services it was after, but on a Sunday morning, the pillar of fire 
came down on the back wall before the church was redone. And you you're seeing this oh, yes. first person. Oh yes, yes. every bit of, mm -hmm. I didn't I I, I I didn't miss a service. It, yeah, <laughs> I was sure of that, but I just want to make sure that's yeah, clear on the camera. Yeah. Yes, sir. And uh, I can tell you what I saw, mm -hmm. but somebody else might have seen something else. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the pillar of fire was on the back wall. As you come in the front of the church, it would have been to your left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And acted out exactly what he put on the blackboard when he was preaching Wow! the church ages. Was it a cross like a screen, or did it change through the phases of the moment? Okay. You know, what I saw, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's all I can say, mm -hmm. uh, it was there on the wall. And what changed in it was the amount of light. So it actually went through the phases. There. Went through every phase. Wow. Wow. And the last phase, totally it looked wow. like there was no light. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was amazing. And let me tell you what a group of And people. how long that, was this just a matter of seconds? Or no, minutes? it would be... Um, I would say a minimum of minutes, but not long, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it, then it changed to another. And is everybody just silent watching this happen? Just A lot of them were screaming. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, my. He was ready to dismiss, and he mm -hmm. said, if you want to see something, look on the back wall. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That was marvelous. <laughs> The whole thing is. Yes, sir. Oh, my. <laughs> I can't get over it. Mm -hmm. it so supernatural mm -hmm. all the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bef and before we get past this period of time, and of course, I want any other events like this that you think of, but one special time I'm, I've always been fascinated with is the time when there were efforts to oust Brother Neville and Brother Branham was supposed to be on the road traveling somewhere and he just pops in out of the blue right during that service as I understand it and he that's when he makes the statements oh that well the pastor is the pastor until yes what is the background of that obviously there was something going on for some period of time with some some uh, uh, you know, uh, there had to have been a little group there pushing for that. Did oh, yeah. What can there you tell was. Us about that? There was. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the uh, same group that was trying to get me out all the time. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, if Brother Branham hadn't put me in, I wouldn't have stayed. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, no. It, it, it got a little rough a few times. So, so they were pushing for a vote that night to vote him out, and and were you surprised to see Brother Branham walk out on the pulpit like every? I'm sure. <laughs> You'll have to see me first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, Brother Branham really appreciated Brother Neville. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. He he was a good man. So, obviously, Brother Neville is aware something's going on to some degree, you would think. And I can imagine that sure did uh, put a charge into him and probably the, the ones who were supporting him at the time for Brother Brown to come put that uh, mutiny, which is nothing more than a mutiny. Uh, That's right. And what kind of man would would be doing that to a man that Brother Branham put in that position is beyond my comprehension. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But some people thought they knowed it all. Oh, sure. That's mm -hmm. what it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> my. Uh, Brother Branham was for Brother Neville a hundred percent. And uh, Brother Neville was a, a good man. Mm -hmm. Real good. Yes, sir. My, my. Oh, man. So any other events like that or other aspects of the supernatural before we move on to your pastorate that you want to highlight that you witnessed? 
Oh my, we could go on all I'm that. I'm sure we could. <laughs> oh yes, mm -hmm. oh yes. Uh, the Lord was certainly in every bit of it. Uh, he'd take me squirrel hunting and he'd discuss things that he didn't discuss otherwise and, and I don't discuss them mm -hmm. because if he hadn't have held it back, I could, but I can't. Sure, sure. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, one day he said, let's go down to your dad's squirrel hunting. I said, okay. Uh, well, we went down there. He said, we'll hunt tomorrow and then we'll stay all night and hunt the next day. And I said, okay. And we got there and uh, he said, now, uh, I saw a pile of hay out in the barn and said, you and me will just sleep out there. <laughs> uh, and uh, my mother found out about it. <laughs> she said, you're not sleeping in the barn here. You're going to sleep in my bed. <laughs> well, that was the first time that I had the opportunity of sleeping with him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We slept upstairs and uh, I asked him a question. He would tell you exactly. I asked him a question. I said, Brother Branham, while we were laying down, I said, Brother Branham, I read in Acts two different things concerning uh, when the light appeared to Paul. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, one of them is they heard the voice mm -hmm. but didn't see the light. Mm -hmm. The other one is they saw the light but didn't hear the voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, he'll have the answer. Mm -hmm. And you know what he said? I don't know. I've wondered about that all of my life and I do not know. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. He, he was up front with you. Yes, being sir. Honest, that's right. Wow. And uh, uh, I want to tell you what... He told me about my dad. My dad wouldn't have nothing to do with this message. Mm -hmm. And it really bothered me. I thought, oh, why? I baptized my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really baptized me. I mean, it really hurt me. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when we went down there squirrel hunting, I thought, that's when my dad will see it. He, he'll do it. Brother Branham talked to him and all. He didn't mention one thing about this message. About Talked to him about fishing and hunting and traveling and all of that, you know. And I thought, oh, my. And I come back, I was worried. Now, the best I remember, the way it went, I was baptizing an old gentleman in the pool. Mm -hmm. When Brother Branham walked by leaving, and I was thinking how I wish that was my dad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The next time I saw Brother Branham, he said, uh, don't you worry about your dad. He's all right. Mm -hmm. Boy, that shocked me to no end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought, how can he be? He said, here's what it is. He said, he won't come up with this people. Mm -hmm. He'll come up with John Wesley's people. He was with them. Wow. And he's all right. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that shocked me. Oh, isn't that wonderful? How about that? Yes, sir. Wonderful. <laughs> Oh yeah, I baptized my mother, and uh, she she loved the message and uh, all of that. Uh, and my dad, I play him a tape, and he'd sit there and go to sleep. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh yeah, and he always said he didn't snore. 
<laughs> One night he laid on the couch and went to sleep. And he was really sawing gourds, you know. <laughs> and I turned the tape recorder on. <laughs> I got a good hearing of all of that, you know. And, and then I woke him up. I said, Daddy, I got something I want you to hear. And he smiled and said, okay. And I played it to him. He just sat there and laughed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so any any other events you want to go over before we get to when you, you transitioned into the pastorate? Uh, there's quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. But okay. uh, I hate to carry it on and on where people get tired of it. Well, I mean, we're, we've got all day, but we don't want to take all of your time, but we certainly don't want to miss something that you'd like to get on record. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. When we went squirrel hunting down at my dad's, Brother Brown went one way, I went another. And the only thing I had was an old 12-gauge shotgun. And uh, the tallest tree in the woods, a squirrel was right up in the top of it. Mm -hmm. And I let him have it in that 12 gauge and burn him a little bit. Mm -hmm. And he moved to the other side of the tree. Mm -hmm. I moved too. Let him have it again. He moved back. We was back and forth and playing <laughs> around the top of that tree, you know. And finally, the squirrel fell out. I thought, oh boy. And I heard somebody coming through the woods. Mm -hmm. It was Brother Brown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said, where's all the game at? <laughs> I pointed at that dead squirrel. I said, right there. He said, oh, no. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. I said, I thought war had been declared. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you mean that's all? I said, that's it right there. <laughs> He said, well, what do you say? <laughs> well, in turn, I didn't know what was going on. He was getting ready to buy me a twenty-two rifle mm. because it's pretty noisy in the woods. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And the next time he came, he had me a, a beautiful... 22 rifle, mm -hmm. and I still got it. I, I'm sure. I put it in my safe. Mm -hmm. I wanted it taken care of. Mm -hmm. I put it and my uh, video of my rake mm -hmm. in my tape, in my safe mm -hmm. because I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose one of them. While we're on the squirrels, I, I'm anxious to know how many squirrels you saw him shoot through the eye. Just about all of them, I guess. He didn't miss. Uh, that's what I understand. No. Uh, and to uh, do that, you not only have to be a good shot, but you've got to do it when they're turned a certain way to get that done. That's right. So it's, to me, it's amazing. That's right. And you know something? Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, hunted with him a lot. And... I never saw him uh, shoot a squirrel that I know of without it being the way he wanted it. Mm -hmm. And I used to set targets for him before we go squirrel hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, we was out there in an old barn, and I'd take a target, and he said, put four thumbtacks to hold the target up there. Mm -hmm. Then he'd say, put another thumbtack right in the middle of the bullseye. Mm -hmm. And he'd back up with that rifle and put a bullet right on the center of that thumbtack <laughs> in the bullseye <laughs> and drive it through the board mm. and put two more bullets in the same hole. Oh my so now I'm ready to go hunting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Wow. And he was just as perfect with the message as he was with his shooting. Absolutely. 
It hit the target every time. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. So unless you think of something else significant, we can maybe move on to, the, to when you took over as pastor and that transition. Well, mm -hmm. it all worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, when they called me, I wanted to know if I'd take it. Mm -hmm. I said, get the both boards together, mm -hmm. trustees and deacons, and have a vote. And if there's one contrary vote, I, I won't come. Mm -hmm. And I said, and then if there's no contrary vote, put it before the church. Mm -hmm. And if there's one contrary vote there, I won't be there. I won't wow. come. Wow. And they called me back later. Said, the signal is to come on. No contrary votes. Wonderful. Yeah. I, I wasn't going to do that. If there was opposition, sure. I didn't want to get in the middle of something. Sure, sure. And what were you doing at this time? What, what you, uh, far, just farming at the time? Let's see. At that time... I just got back here from Tucson, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I was down on the farm mm -hmm. that my dad left for me mm -hmm. when uh, he passed on. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there, and uh, I was uh, uh, I'd taken over the dairy and was uh, milking cows. And that's a twenty-four-hour. Day job. You can say that yes again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. But I enjoyed it. I, mm -hmm. I like I like the farm. But mm -hmm. uh, then I moved back up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, any any uh, I'm sure there are many highlights during your pastorate of 46 years. Anything that you like to get into uh, during the pastorate? Mm -hmm. Well, I just had to overlook a lot of things, you know. There, sure. there was a group mm -hmm. that wanted me out all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, they got a petition to get me out. Mm -hmm. And the way the petition read was this. Is there anything you'd like to see changed in the Brown Tabernacle? Mm -hmm. And most anybody could say yes. Mm -hmm. That's a sign right here. <laughs> oh my goodness well, gracious. That worked good for them, I guess, mm -hmm. until they went to Brother Nash, a black brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they presented it to him. When they did, he said, do you see that door you come in at? I said, yeah. He said, out the same door. <laughs> God bless Brother Nash. Huh? <laughs> he was precious. Vote with your feet, right? Yeah. He, he, I believe he lived up close to 100. Wow. Wow. Yeah. God bless him. He made my day one day. He, uh, uh, I was getting up, you know... Uh, nothing like I am now. But, uh, I never dreamed I'd get to 90, but anyway, uh, I was getting up pretty good, and uh, I think I was in my early 80s. Mm -hmm. And Brother Nash come up to put in his birthday offering. Mm -hmm. The song leader said, uh, How old are you, Brother Nash? <laughs> He said, 95. <laughs> I said, he made my day. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, Brother Nash was a lovely, lovely fellow. Mm -hmm. One time I'd been to make a sick call up in Ohio. And... Uh, Brother and Sister Nash went with us, my wife, and, I, and uh, on our way back, 
I stopped at a little souvenir shop to get a bite to eat. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sister Nash found a little trinket and said, uh, Ma loved Pa. Pa loved women. Ma caught Pa with two in swimming. Here lies Pa. <laughs> <laughs> She she got the biggest kick out of that, and she called Brother Nash over mm -hmm. and had to show him all of that. This is my rifle that Brother Branham gave me when we went down to my dad's a squirrel hunting, and I used a 12-gauge shotgun, and uh, there was a squirrel right in the top of the tallest tree in the woods, and I was peppering him pretty good and he'd move on the other side of the tree and I'd shoot him again that old 12 gauge and it'd roar like a cannon <laughs> and uh, uh, finally he fell out and I just standing there looking at him and heard somebody coming through the woods and it was Brother Branham. He said, where's all the game? I said, uh, right there. He said, oh, no, no. He said, I thought somebody declared war up here. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, that's it right there. And uh, the next time he asked me to go squirrel hunting with him, he had me this rifle. And I'm so pleased with it, I keep it in my locker. I don't want nobody to make, make sure nobody doesn't get this. When Obama talks about taking up the guns, all right, here's one he's going to have a hard time getting. <laughs> <laughs> you told us before how you escaped death twice, and we'd love to have those stories as well. All right. Um, yes, I did. Uh, Brother Billy Paul and me went to Trinidad for services, and uh, we had very nice services. And there was a minister in Guyana, which is another island in South America. And he wanted us to come over there and stay all night with him and then have services the next day. And uh, we agreed. So we flew into Guyana one night about 1 o'clock when we got off the plane. And there was probably a 100 people ahead of us uh, going into station and uh, uh, the officials of Guyana of the country come straight to us and said you fellas can't come in our country they didn't give us any reason nothing said you just can't come in we'll take you and hold you until your luggage gets in we'll put you on another plane and send you out of the country well <clears throat> we were flying out and I was looking down below, and we were flying over Georgetown. You know, that's where that fellow killed all them people at. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see Georgetown lights. And he said, why do you think this happened? I said, I don't know. It could be the Lord, but I do not know. And it went on that way. The next morning, we got up. And according to the paper, somebody had, I think two people, I believe what they said, had entered that home and they killed the preacher and uh, were close to killing his wife and she escaped. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we're going to stay all night tonight before we, uh, we're going to have service. So you would have been staying in that home? I'd been the in that house. home. Well, then... Two people from Guyana, a man and his wife, came to the tabernacle, and uh, he and I got to talking about that situation. And uh, he said, would you like to hear the rest of the story? I said, yes, I would. He said, all right, I can tell you. Word got out that two people from the United States, which was Brother Billy and me, we're going to stay all night with that preacher that night and they actually come in there to kill them two people and because they were not there they killed the preacher wow wow
Oh my goodness. When he first I started. really don't remember how long it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he came over. I was running a service station and told the wife and me he was going to have to leave us. And uh, it hurt me so bad. I thought it can't be because there's a third pull coming up mm -hmm. and it hasn't happened yet. And uh, we took him out to eat at a little stone restaurant there. And uh, my wife, I think she'd gone to the restroom. And uh, I said, Brother Branham, does God change his tactics? I said, when David was on the scene, God trained him all of his life for a showdown with Goliath. And I said, and uh, he didn't put another man in his place to fight Goliath. I said, does, and you, you're the only, you're the only one that God ever trained to all the tactics of the devil. You've got that, that you could meet him. And you know what you're doing. And I said, uh, does God change his tactics from that situation to you leaving the scene? And uh, I never will forget it. He just smiled. He said, God don't change his tactics. <laughs> I want to thank you folks for listening to this. It's been an honor and a privilege to have these brothers in our home and to be able to go over some of the things that we experienced with Brother Branham. It's been an honor and it's been a blessing. And I thank you very much for what part you've played in it and also for the audience that ever has the opportunity to hear this. And God bless you.